I'm Nelly, and we are here in Svalbard exploring the life cycles of plants with BBC Earth. This is a series about life cycles. But why life cycles? Well, everything in the universe happens in cycles, so we know they're important. From the birth and destruction of a star to the Earth's rotation around the sun, which makes the seasons. So in the plant kingdom, the cycle is usually pretty consistent. The plants germinate and then they grow and harvest all the energy they can from the sun before they reproduce and then die. And then the cycle starts all over again. So let's find out more about this cycle. If we look at the evolutionary order of the plant groups and their life cycles, we can spot some pretty drastic changes. Most notably, that they have evolved to live further and further away from water. So let's look at the different plant types and see how they've evolved over time. Let's start where the history of land plants begin, with the bryophytes. And bryophytes may sound like a fancy word, and it is, because it's Greek but it means something as simple as moss plants. And bryophyte is a group that consists of hornworts, liverworts, and mosses. They are the simplest and oldest land plants, way older than the dinosaurs. And they evolved from algae living in freshwater before realizing if they could get up on land, there would be plenty of space to grow. But the water had provided protection from the sun, so in order to make this change, the bryophytes first had to evolve to form a layer over their tissue to prevent them from drying out or boiling. You can see this yourself if you take a plant that has never been outside and place it directly in the sun. So the bryophytes on land evolved to produce this protective layer called cuticula, which consists of fat, wax, and a protein called cutin. The most complex group of bryophytes are the mosses, and they have solved one of the hardest tasks in plant evolution, and that is making cells with really thin walls so that they can transport water. Most of the water in bryophytes will evaporate, because in order to take up carbon dioxide, they have these tiny holes in their leaves, and most of the water will escape through them. But that's okay, because whenever bryophytes get too dry to do photosynthesis, they'll just take a break. This grey patch ahead of me is one of my favourite mosses. It's called the woolly moss and you can probably tell why because it's quite grey and woolly. But watch what happens when I pour water on it. So what you saw now is when it's grey, that means it's dry. And then if you pour water on it, it turns green. Actually, bryophytes are so bad at dying that a lump of moss was recently revived in a lab. And that lump of moss had just thawed out from underneath a glacier, where it had been for the last 1,500 years. That is one epic nap. Over time, a new group of plants emerged the seedless vascular plants. This group consists of ferns, horsetail, and club moss, which, confusingly enough, isn't moss. They're more advanced than bryophytes when it comes to water transportation. Their life cycle is pretty much still the same as bryophytes and algae, but their vascular tissue is very different. Where bryophytes have thin-walled cells to lead water, seedless vascular plants have empty thin-walled cells with holes in them. These dead cells with holes in them make up what is known as vascular tissue. And ferns, roses, blueberry plants and pines have it too. But not only that, they also changed the holes in their leaves. They developed specialized cells around the holes that close any time the plant becomes too dry, so it doesn't dry all the way out. It doesn't sound like much, but it means that they can just slow down their photosynthesis instead of going completely dormant like the bryophytes. 
taking it even further, we have the vascular plants. And oh, what progress! So these plants have roots to take up water from the ground, but they can do it at a much faster rate because of the loss of perforated walls between each cell. So these plants were able to move further onto dry land because they could access the water from deeper into the ground. This category with vascular tissue, roots and seeds is called the gymnosperms. It comes from Greek meaning naked seeds. Gym means naked because when the ancient Greeks did gymnastics, they were naked. <laughs> Let's not get distracted. A seed is more protected than a spore. Because while most spores have to germinate fast or they will die, a seed can wait for a couple of seasons or even years before they decide to germinate. This means they can wait for the perfect conditions to grow. And that's not even all the seedy plants have to offer. They figured out a way to grow wider. That's called secondary growth and it's what makes trees possible. Gymnosperms include spruce trees, ginkgo trees, and a lot of other nudists. And I call them nudists because they keep their seeds naked. The second group of vascular plants with seeds, and the latest addition to the evolutionary tree, are the angiosperms. Another Greek word with angio meaning vase. After fertilization, the vase turns into what we know as the fruit. Angiosperms is the most diverse plant group, containing grass with their long leaves, roses with their thorns, water lilies with their floating foliage, huge oak trees, and cacti. Angiosperms have a layer of cells around the egg that resemble a vase, and this vase is what turns into fruit. And us humans love trying to put the different types of fruit into categories. Botanists looked at the avocado and mango and said, okay, fruits with only one seed inside, that is real fruit. Then they looked at blueberries and cranberries and said, when the fruit has plenty of seeds inside, it's a berry. Then they looked at the strange stuff from the pea family and said everything from this family and nothing else is peas and beans. After the peas and beans, they looked at fruit that gets hard on the outside and called it a nut. Last but not least, they made a category for fake fruit, which is for fruit that is not made up out of the little boss, but rather from the petals of the flower. And in this group, we find apples and pears. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? No, <laughs> because we use the fruits in different ways, so we get confused. So a tomato you would put in a salad, right? So it's a vegetable. Well, no, it's a fruit, but that's not the entire truth, because not only is it a fruit, uh, it's a berry, because it has so many seeds inside. While we're on the subject of berries, let's look at the strawberry. Uh, that's got to be a berry, right? It's in the name. Well, no, <laughs> because the fleshy bulb that we eat isn't actually made from the vase, it's made from the petals of the flower. So it's categorized as fake fruit. But the seeds aren't on the inside like in apples and pears, they're on the outside and they have a hard shell, so they're nuts. So a strawberry is actually fake fruit with nuts on top. But there's another type of berry, you guessed it, the cucumber, because it has plenty of seeds inside. <laughs> the baseline of botany and the evolutionary order of the plants. In this series, we'll delve deeper into the growth and development of plants and what happens when they die. We'll also be looking at examples from the four evolutionary groups of what's normal and then some unique examples. So join us as we take a deeper dive into the quietly amazing world of plants.